Hi guys this is Hirasaki. This story is all about what if Naruto was part of the Avengers. Naruto left the elemental nations and wound up in a world where flying metal man, magic, and gods exist. Before we start kindly like and subscribe to this channel, and look over the description box for the author of this amazing storyline. Welcome aboard. Chapter 89, New York Rumble Part 2. Brooklyn, New York. June 2, 2010, 2010H Local. Paycheck? We're getting paid. Steve asked. No, but someone else might. We're not the only ones he called. Peggy answered. Both super soldiers were wearing all black tactical gear and masks to prevent anyone from figuring out who they were. Because of this, Steve opted out from using his shield, or any shield for that matter, since it would be just a dead giveaway. An enhanced individual with a shield would immediately be linked to Captain America, and as he was supposed to be still in recovery. Let's go. He's about to break through the barricade. Peggy said when the abomination threw a car towards one of the Humvee forming the blockade. Remember, we can't outmatch him in strength, but we can outmaneuver him. Be light on your feet, and don't stay long in his range. I think you know that I can handle that. Steve replied with a smile. That's why I'm reminding you. I remember how you fought never backing down. That'll give us more problems if you take on a full swing than just backing down. Steve looks like he swallowed something sour but nodded nonetheless. Even he, he himself acknowledges that he can be a bit stubborn. Without another word, the duo charged from one blind corner behind the monster and punched it behind the knee, causing the abomination to fold. However, all it did was infuriate Blonsky, causing its attention to focus mainly on them, relieving the pressure from the military at the front. Steve and Peggy moved together like a seamless machine. Steve opted to be in the front lines by not dodging more than necessary and actually parrying a lot of the blows. This gives Peggy, who's a great, deal more agile and athletic due to Naruto's training, a lot more chances to attack Blonsky cleanly. Although the massive difference in size and natural toughness mean most of the attacks don't go through. It's a good thing that they just need to buy time for the big hitter. Blonsky took a few steps back, stunned, after a particularly powerful kick. So, Ross was able to perfect the serum. Blonsky said with a feral grin. It's no use though. He took a step back and opened his arms wide, showing off his body. Look at me. I'm faster, stronger, and tougher than both of you combined. Then why can't you get a solid hit in? Steve taunted. Blonsky flashed a feral grin before hitting Steve with an absolutely brutal Spartan kick, sending Steve towards a parked car. Like that? Blonsky asked. As a testament to Peggy's professionality, she didn't even gave Steve a second glance before doing a backflip and picked up a utility hole cover before tossing it to the abomination's head, buying a few seconds of relief. Steve slowly got himself out of the wreckage onto the street before stretching his back a bit. That st stings. Steve groaned out. Told you to stay mobile. Peggy chided as she retreated from Blonsky's immediate range. Yeah. Steve replied, agreeing with Peggy. When will the supposed backup arrive? It should be any second now. Blonsky quickly recovered from the direct hit and lumbered his way towards them. We need to buy a few more seconds. We can't have that abomination raging across the city. You know me. Steve moved towards Peggy's side while doing some bounce steps to loosen up his muscles. I can do this all day. Steve quickly rushed Blonsky, preventing the giant from using its larger mass to gain some momentum. Blonsky just smiled, expecting another slugfest. However, something unexpected happened that caused both Blonsky and Steve to stop in their tracks. A mass dropped from the sky, created a crater, and it suspiciously sounded like a bag of meat. Looking inside the hole, they could see an unremarkable man lying face down. Now, Steve, Peggy, and Blonsky have seen many parachuting accidents. 
soldiers whose parachutes never opened and just dropped straight to the ground. Assuming the guy fell from the helicopter that flew over, then the body should have been more damaged broken bones, open skull, or at the very least some lacerations. The man in the crater doesn't even show a speck of blood. The more peculiar thing, though, was the crater formed by the impact. People dropping, no matter how high, don't make craters. Humans aren't just heavy enough to make the force necessary when the terminal velocity was factored in. Peggy must have realized something since she pulled Steve by the scruff of his neck and bolted away from the crater. Peggy. Blonsky's the other way. Steve pointed out, only slightly fighting off Peggy's pull. I know. We need to make some distance. Reinforcements here. As soon as Peggy replied, a monstrous roar echoed blasted from the crater. The Hulk's here. Brooklyn, New York. New York. June 2, 2010, 2015 H. Local. Oh, God. There's two of them. PFC Phillips can't help but blurt out as soon as another Titan emerged from the hole. Move everyone back another block. The Master Sergeant's voice can be heard from the radio. I want squads 1 to 12 to move into the red zone and check every nook and cranny for non combatants. Make sure to stay out of the streets and avoid getting anyone's attention. The rest are going to hold the line. No one goes in the area. Phillips released a sigh of relief since he was in squad 16. There's no way he's getting close to the two monsters having their grudge match. Stark Expo, Queens, New York. June 2, 2010, 2005 H. Local. Today. I present to you the new phase of the United States military. Hammer pointed behind him with a flourish. The Hammer drones. Heavily modified humanoid drones raised from the floor in four groups of eight, one for each branch of the United States military, accompanied by Justin Hammer's over-the-top presentation. When the final group was raised, all the drones saluted alongside Hammer at the crescendo of the background music, sending half of the audience into a standing ovation. Hammer was basking from the attention when two armor flew in, and Superhero dropped onto the stage, sandwiching Hammer. The crowd went ballistic when two Iron Man armor showed up. Tony and Rhodey didn't even acknowledge the crowd when the alarm started blaring in the pavilion, turning the excitement into confusion. The staff on site quickly set into action and ushered the people out OG the pavilion. What are you doing? Hammer said with a whisper. With his microphone still connected to the speakers, everyone in the audience could hear his voice. What are you doing? You're ruining everything. We know, we know Vanko's with you, and he basically created those Class F imitations. Tony replied, not acknowledging Hammer's rant. It's funny if you think about it. He walked towards one of the drones and tapped its chest. At this point, only essential personnel and some of Hammer's lackeys are left inside the pavilion. The police should already be surrounding the place and creating a safe zone. It took you, a 120 IQ CEO whose greatest strength is copying my stuff, and a 160 IQ emo with a flair for the dramatics. Hammer was practically seething by this point, and it looks he isn't the only one who heard Tony's tirade. A Marine Hammer drones quickly pulled its arm back and suddenly punched Tony. Only Tony's increased reaction time from continuous use of his armor enabled him to dodge the oncoming metal fist straight to his face. Tony rolled out and aimed his arms towards the drones while opening all his arm weapons. Rhodey quickly followed suit and aimed his heavier loadouts. The drone's face indicator lights changed from blue to red before stepping of their platforms. What? What's happening? Hammer asked, shocked at the sudden turn of events. In his understanding, those drones can only salute and march around in pre-programmed route. That's Vanko screwing with you. Tony replied. Here we go, Rody Bear. It's showtime. Everything was at a standstill. The only thing moving was the staff and Hammer, who was slowly moving away from where the supposed action would start. 
It's pretty weird seeing that there's visible tension between the two groups when one group was made up of drones. Just like a dam giving way, the fight began. All Air Force and Marine drones flew up, breaking the glass roof, sending shards of glass raining down. It's a miracle nobody left behind was hurt. I'll take on the flyers. You handle everything down here. Tony said to Rhodey before flying off. But I'm the Air Force pilot. Rhodey shouted, but it fell on deaf ears. That was when one of the Army drones fired an anti-tank round straight to his chest. It's a thing that his armor was both highly advanced and thick. So that's how you want to play it, huh? Let me show you what I, I got. Rhodey aimed his railgun towards the offending drone and blasted it with ultrasonic shards of metal, effectively making the drone a human-shaped pile of scrap metal. The remaining drones quickly scattered, opting to make their way out by blasting the walls. Oh fuck. Now it's a cat and mouse. Tony was experiencing something similar. He's got to give credit where the credit is due, the drones were better at flying than he expected. The marine drones have shitty maneuverability, and they lose more of it when firing their wrist-mounted armaments. The Air Force ones could keep up with him in low-speed maneuvers, and their shoulder-mounted machine guns could actually do some damage if he sustained a prolonged fire. That's why he had no choice but to use hit-and-run tactics to deal with them, even for his superior tech. However, even with Tony's hit-and-run tactics, he must continue pressing the drones. Otherwise, they might turn their attention to the crowds below. Even from here, he can see the ground-based drones already wrecking the area around the pavilion. Rockets and tank rounds were firing wildly, aiming at doing maximum damage. Only Rhodey's intervention prevented the worst of it. Tony was analyzing the situation when the Air Force drones suddenly broke their usual pattern and separated to cut off his potential escape routes, surprising him. Jarvis quickly sent optional routes to his HUD, but he would still take some damage by plowing through the drones with his micro-missiles. He was about to fire the missile when the drone's head in front of him suddenly exploded. Where did that come from? Tony asked Jarvis after he escaped his current predicament. Tracing the shot. Mapping the area via satellite. Hacking the camera with the best angle. Bringing it up on the HUD, sir. Jarvis replied. Tony saw an African-American man with a 50 caliber sniper rifle on top of a high-rise high near the expo. That's Naruto's guy. He was supposed to be in Gulmira. Tony said to no one in particular. Check to see if he has comms and patch me through. Connecting, now. You know I can handle that, right? Tony said to Eric. There was a moment of silence before Eric replied. Not from where I'm standing, white boy. Eric replied in a perfect mix of condescending and sarcastic. Tony smiled, hearing the reply. You wanna help? Check the people on the ground too. Let's see how many you can take out. You're on Stark. There should be at least 50 more incoming. Plenty of hammer drones to go around. Well, as long as Vanko could finish what he's doing. Or at least that's what Naruto said. Ha, huh, they really got too much time on their hands. Chapter 90, New York Rumble Part 3 Hammer Industries Research and Development, New York June 2, 2010, 2010 H. Local The Hammer Industries R&D building was a massive complex spanning four city blocks in Queens, New York. Low-risk weapons and experimental technology were done in these buildings. However, one of these buildings was where Hammer hides some of his less-than-legal activities. The Northwest Annex poses as a field office, admin office, and warehouse, but in reality, it houses and tests some of its slightly illegal techs. So it's kind of a no-brainer that this was where Hammer would stash a not-so-dead Ivan Vanko and have him recreate the Iron Man armor. Of course, Vanko stabbed Hammer in the back and instead created semi-autonomous drones while creating a fully functioning suit behind the scenes. scenes. 
To be fair, Vanco upgraded the software of the Hammer drones and the network's security, so Justin Hammer didn't get screwed all the way. A heavily tinted, carbon black Hennessy Venom GT can be seen parked just outside the Northwest Annex. Inside were Nat and Jessica. You ready? Natasha asked. Yeah. Jessica replied with a smile. Can't wait to get started. Natasha just stared at her for a second before nodding and stepping off the car. She's wearing her vibranium weaved widow suit and full face vibranium mask. She also temporarily colored her hair ebony black as her natural red hair would be too eye catching. Leaving as small of a footprint as possible would make the cleanup significantly easier. Jessica decided to head in the opposite direction where what she usually does, although with some modifications a zipped up black leather rider jacket over a white tank top, black jeans, and leather boots. The only change she did was add leather riding gloves and a military scarf mask. I have to ask. Natasha started as they were walking towards the building's front door. Are you wearing anything bulletproof? Jessica adopted a thinking pose before answering. Well, everything I'm wearing was either a gift or had been held by Naruto for more than five minutes, so I'm sure everything is more than just bulletproof. Natasha shrugged in agreement. Naruto's previous profession made him very paranoid. Even the flimsiest of thongs he would give his girls would probably survive a kilogram of C4. The pair confidently walked through the door, and Natasha strutted past the first guard before accelerating. She put down the two guards behind the first using an athletic neck lock takedown. Jessica, on the other hand, took the more direct approach and just held the first guard by his, sh by his shirt before throwing him to the ceiling, effectively knocking him out. Jess, check how much strength you use. Nat pointed up toward the ceiling, where there was a clearly visible crack. These guards aren't enhanced. They're a lot flimsier than what you're used to. Yeah. Jess replied while scratching her head a bit, embarrassed. Kind of felt that when he dropped. Well, he's still breathing, so it should be good. Natasha just chuckled while shaking her head. She's not sure if Jess was already like that or was corrupted by Naruto. Personally, she believes it's somewhere in between. Nat walked towards the terminal in the reception area. She plugged in a flash drive in one of the computer terminals. A worm would be uploaded in the system which would decimate the local network. This would effectively cut off unencrypted and conventional forms of communication from leaving and entering the building. It wouldn't do jack shit to the secure signal used by the hammer drones, but it would prevent security from calling reinforcements. The pair then walked through the central corridor while decimating the guards. Those overpaid payacops could do almost nothing to arguably the world's best female assassin and an enhanced individual. It didn't take long for them to reach the central area. As soon as they opened the door, they saw a small army of offline hammer drones standing shoulder to shoulder. Fuck. Jessica let out. I'm going to hurt him. Hurt him badly. I'll join you. Natasha replied. How is this a bit more than twenty? Twenty. Of course, he's not wrong but comes on. Naruto had given every member a small outline on each of their target and possible scenario they might get themselves into. Like how Vanko had made the hammer drone and recreated the Iron Man armor. It came extremely close to the Iron Munger armor by stain in appearance with the added electric whips. The only group that should be mainly in the dark was the Abomination group since it was literally a last-minute event. Now, they just had undeniable confirmation that Naruto hid information, probably for his amusement. That's just a trait Nat could never remove from Naruto. In non-dire situations, well non-dire according to him, he would always prioritize entertainment value over logic or even lives. It's only due to the backlash that will annoy them to no end, and Natasha and Jessica's influence prevents him from ultimately going off the bender. Let's find Vanko before he can activate the lot. The duo burst through multiple rooms to find where Vanko was. It took them five minutes, searching two rooms at a time, before finding the desired space. 
although, it looks like they're already too late. Inside the small, messed up room was a reasonably advanced computer setup, a bed, and two guards tied up by electrical wires from the ceiling. Fuck. We're too late. Natasha rushed towards the computer and checked what was on the screen. We're really too late. It shows that Vanko already started the Hammer Drone's startup sequence and left some instructions. Go to the warehouse and see if you can find a way to stop them. I'll try something on my end. Brooklyn, New York. June 2nd, 2010, 2015 H Local. Come on, come on. We need to get out of here. Sergeant Garcia said while basically pulling a mother while carrying her child. He's one of the squads tasked with checking the surrounding buildings and getting non-combatants out of the red and yellow zones. The child was already crying. Davies. We're getting out now. There are only two buildings o over. Yes, Sarge. It took only a few minutes before everyone in their squad piled out of the rear exit and ran away from the main street, only using the alleyways. They were quite some distance away when the building suddenly collapsed. There were a couple of ways that could cause the building to collapse, and none of that mattered, as the soldiers and the civilians would surely die if they were still inside the building. The neighboring building collapsed soon after, and Garcia was sure that the people inside hadn't evacuated yet. Fuck. Somebody needs to pay for that fucking abomination. Someone from their squad voiced out. They were still navigating the alleyways when something caught their attention. A reasonably large man wearing an all-black tactical gear walked down the emergency exit with two people slung over his shoulder. This man was Steve Rogers himself. A military legend. Of course, none of these soldiers knows this. They only know him as one of the people holding off the abomination before the Hulk literally dropped from the sky. Soldiers. Can you help these people get out of here? There are a few more buildings I have to check. Steve said before gently dropping the people on his shoulder next to the soldiers and leaving, but not without a second look. Brooklyn, New York. June 2, 2010, 2015 H Local. I'm not much for cursing, but I think I could let this one slide. Bloody hell. Peggy let out while looking at the Hulk and the Abomination duking it out on the streets. The streets were wrecked, and some of the buildings had already collapsed. The military had already pushed back the line another block, and it's only two blocks away from Queens and five blocks from the southwest border of the Stark Expo. Even from their line, they could already see some small explosions and smoke. Not to mention the fact that, that there's already some call for backup from the NYPD. Peggy pulled out her phone and dialed for Naruto. How's the expo? Peggy asked. There's a lot of fireworks, but nothing exciting as of yet. Naruto answered. Does Tony have insurance for the lot? Yup. Enough to rebuild the whole thing, and then some. No idea how Pepper pulled that of. How about the evacuation? Especially the southwest side. You're in luck, my lady. The southern part is primarily clear. All the attendees are being moved to the northern entrance. That's good cause I'll try to move the fight there. It's open, insured, and non-residential. Didn't you guys start at the warehouse district? How far have you moved already? Fifteen blocks. Peggy deadpan since it's impossible for Naruto not to watch what's happening. Wow. They got far. Naruto said with his usual cheery tone irritating Peggy. You need help with moving the fight? That would be appreciated. Evacuate everyone from the south. Peggy would really like to shove the offer up Naruto's arse, but there's no reasonable and safe way for her to move the fight. Especially as it would bring them across some residential and commercial buildings, exponentially increasing the difficulty. It didn't take long before a rain of kunais to pelt down on the Hulk and the Abomination. Normal puny knives would never hurt the two behemoths, and to be fair, these kunais were made out of ordinary steel. 
it's the user that made the difference. Naruto was throwing the knives fast enough to cause sonic booms. These were more than enough to get the pair's attention. Hey! Dunderhead! Not you, green guy! The crotchless ugly guy! Naru Naruto shouted while standing on top of a nearby wrecked car. He's wearing his Nine Tails outfit. Nine Tails. Get out of here, or I'll smash you to the ground right after I kill this guy. Blonsky replied, showing his irritation. How about no, Dickless? Naruto taunted again before throwing another storm of kunai, burying Blonsky in a small crate. That certainly got the asshole's attention as he started speeding up towards Naruto. Naruto, for his part, turned towards the expo and began a slow jog, well, a slow jog for him, towards the expo. Naruto was quickly approaching the military line. All the soldiers were already setting up their gear and preparing to open fire. Wind release, great breakthrough. Naruto whispered to himself before punching forward. A powerful gust of wind pushed the soldiers, Humvees, trucks, and tanks towards the side, keeping everyone from doing anything. Naruto pulled out his phone while Blonsky was following him, and the Hulk was chasing Blonsky. Hey, Jarv. Can you patch me through Tony? Naruto asked. Of course, sir. I am connecting you now. Hey. Tony. What you doing? Oh. I'm busy right now dodging hammer drones. So I'll talk to you later. Oh, for sure. I just want to tell you that I'm bringing some extra party members. I know you're not bringing the big guys to my expo. Come on. You have insurance. No. Pepper would freak out and hang us by the balls. Shit. There were five seconds of silence before Naruto finally replied. There's nothing to do now. We're here. Chapter 91, New York Rumble Part 4 Stark Expo, New York June 2, 2010, 2020 H Local Come here you little shit. Blonsky shouted out as he picked up a car and threw it to Naruto. All right. Naruto, Naruto hirishin in front of Blonsky which promptly bashed him to the ground. But the moment Blonsky's fist hit Naruto, he burst into a plume of smoke, leaving Blonsky confused. He didn't have any time to think about what happened as something punched him from behind. Ragig. Hulk smash. Hulk roared while pounding Blonsky to the ground. Eham. A voice interrupted Hulk, halting him mid-punch and turning his head up towards the voice. What are you doing? Tony asked. Grr. Was the Hulk's only reply, and it looks like it's more than enough. Ugh. Tony slowly backed of while raising his hands. I'll be right there, dealing with my own stuff. He took another look at the pale hairless ape on the ground, slowly recovering. If you need help just shout, or roar, whichever is more comfortable for you. And if you finish faster, help out a bit big guy. Tony flew away to intercept some hammer drones. His micro-missiles proved to be a devastating weapon against the AI-controlled drones. They just can't execute a complex maneuver to dodge the agile projectiles. However, what the hammer drones lack in complexity they make up for in sheer numbers. Hammer carried in truckloads of the drones in the expo, probably to show them off to the military in some backroom discussion. Well, this just showed them how good hammer tech was on everything more complicated than an AK. Stark. Hey. Is this thing working? Tony could hear someone familiar through his comms unit. Emo girl? Tony asked, confused as Jarvis should be regulating his comms. Stark. I know you know who I am so don't play this game with me. All right. Chill out. Why are you calling now? Like I've been saying to everyone, I'm kinda busy right now. That's just what I'm calling you about. You're not going to like what I'm about to tell you next. 
I don't care what news networks are saying about the expo right now. Tony drawled out. I'm not in our apartment right now, jackass. I'm with Nat. Your ex-secretary. That's super spy. Oh come on. Am I the only one who doesn't know about that? Wait you live with her, of course you know. Focus. Nat says you got a hammer drone army heading towards you. How many? A hundred. A hundred. A hundred? How the hell did Hammer and Vanko make that much? Cause it's like two hundred grand apiece. Nat's voice could be heard shouting from quite a distance away. You're with Natasha Lai? Why the hell did Naruto send you at Hammer? Long story short, I'm stronger and tougher than I look. Jess said in the most exasperated tone possible. Just know the drones are three minutes away while Vanko will arrive in six. FYI he has a suit. Of course, he has one. Everybody has one. We'll be there in ten minutes. Nat just copying everything she needs. All right. We'll just finish up here before the second wave arrives. Tony cut off the line before continuing in another. You heard that right? Yeah. I'll start cleaning up here. You mind if I break a few buildings? I want to say no, but it looks like I'll have to break some too. Stark Expo, New York. June 2, 2010, 2023 H Local. Peter Parker's life can be described as luckily unlucky. Born on August 10, 2001, Peter was born to a very loving family. Richard and Mary Parker Richard and Mary work as scientists for Oscorp working on another super soldier program. Both of them also work as undercover agents for S.H.I.E.L.D. monitoring Osborne's progress, and that's what got them killed. The Parkers recreated a viable way to recreate the super soldier program. But seeing as how this technology could be abused both by Osborne and S.H.I.E.L.D., they locked it in a genetic lock and key before trying to disappear. They're just not good enough. It's a, it's a good thing that they left Peter to Richard's brother's family. Ben, 32, and May, 29, were a relatively young couple who found out early on that they can't have children of their own, or even if they did, it would be a dangerous pregnancy. So, even though it was a sad affair when Richard and Mary died when Peter was a little over four, they're more than happy to love and take care of Peter. It's just a little hard to suddenly accommodate a preschooler with a salary from being a construction worker and a nurse. Those jobs were also quite time-intensive leaving little time for taking care of Peter. It's a good thing that Peter himself was a very low-maintenance kid. Aside from the low self-esteem, general aloofness, and lack of general social skills, Peter basically takes care of himself. Peter saved himself from an early grave since he saved himself from May Parker's infamous home cooking. Peter inherited a lot from his parents, from his brown hair to persistent attitude. However, there's one thing that would immediately stand out if somebody met him, and his parents, his intelligence. Peter's very intelligent for his age. As an incoming fourth grader, he already has a basic understanding of biology, computer science, technology, and algebra. All of these he learned without special instruction, but with ordinary library time. Now, Ben and May were great parental figures for Peter, but they can't remove his melancholy. Losing his parents at a young age had taken a major toll on his mental health. That's why Tony Stark's, Peter's hero ever since he became Iron Man, revival of the Stark Expo, which was happening only 15 blocks away from the Parker apartment, couldn't come at a better time. The couple took two days off work to allow Peter to explore the expansive Stark Expo grounds. With his meager savings, Peter bought an Iron Man helmet, and he never stopped smiling since. Ben and May loved it so much that they decided to buy him the gauntlet. It was late, late in the night and about to leave when the worst happened. Evil robots started shooting and blowing up the Expo. The quick evacuation caused Peter to separate from his guardians. Seeing that he lost his guardians, Peter did a smart dumb thing, 
getting away from the stampede of the crowd and hiding in one corner. Peter only left his hidey hole when it became quieter. He slowly crawled out and took a look around. He walked around while putting his head on a swivel, looking for his guardians or the police. Uncle Ben. Aunt May. Uncle Ben. Aunt May. Ben. May. Anyone. Peter shouted hoping anyone would notice him. Three people noticed him. Well, technically one person like the last two was a robot and the other was a demigod. A hammer drone dropped in front of Peter and stared directly at him. The inferior AI of the drone determined that the Iron Man helmet Peter was wearing was enough proof to show that he was indeed Iron Man Peter's raising of his Iron Man gauntlet didn't help any bit. The army-type hammer drone brought down its tank turret and aimed it at Peter. His knees were already shaking, but in his young mind, he has no other recourse but to stand his ground, no matter the outcome. So it was practically serendipity when Tony dropped behind Peter and shoot down the hammer drone himself. Good job, kid. Tony said before flying away. That moment would forever be engraved in Peter's mind. Tony Stark flew down, saving him and praising him before flying away. That would be an integral part of his psyche for years to come. While Peter remained stunned due to what happened, Naruto decided to make his move. Now, one might ask why he would bother with helping one lost kid. It's not due to the kindness of his heart. It's due to something he saw with his special eyes. Peter was naturally absorbing nature chakra rather than expelling it to the earth, and he hadn't turned into stone, something more commonly seen on summon animals. Hey, kid. Naruto asked as he nonchalantly walked to Peter. You lost? Using his dojitsu, Naruto could see Peter's hopeful expression turn into hesitance through the mask. You're not a an evil robot too, are you? Peter asked in an admittedly cute way. Do I look like a robot? No. Are you asking? No. Then come on. I'll take you back to your parents. I don't have parents. They're dead. Peter plainly stated. Normal people would reel back and apologize hearing that kind of reply from a kid, but Naruto just smiled wider. Cool. I don't have parents, too. Naruto replied, causing Peter to tilt his head in confusion hearing that reply. Got girlfriends, though. They make me do stuff I don't want to do. Like cleaning up after myself. Peter just glossed over the girlfriend's part. So come on. Let's find your guardians. He ended while extending his hand. Uncle Ben said don't talk to strangers, but I guess it's a little late for that. Well, Aunt May said don't follow with strangers. Good rules. All right. Naruto extended his hand once again. I'm Naruto. Peter hesitated for a moment before shaking Naruto's hand. Hi. I'm Peter Parker. That's it. Can we go now? Okay. Peter took Naruto's left hand and followed him with a skip in his step, totally ignoring the explosions and flying robots. It would be ridiculously easy to kidnap you. Are you kidnapping me? Peter asked with a small quiver of his lips. No. Not now. Not now? Never mind that. Let's just go. Naruto let out before putting on some shades. It took them ten minutes with occasional small talk before they reached the police line holding the crowd back and defending them from the drones. It's a good thing that the drones have little to no interest in them. Nevertheless, some casualties have already been recorded between the cops and the guests. Hey. You guys good? Naruto greeted the hyper-alert cops causing them to point all their guns at him. They quickly pulled back though when they saw a kid holding onto his arm. Looking for this kid's guardian. Can you point me to the nearest distressed group? Uh. Follow the path. There's a group coordinating missing persons by gate 12. 
One stunned police answered. Thanks. Look go kid. Another short walk later and they saw a relatively large group huddled at one side of the gate, talking loudly. Some were even crying. Naruto's sharp ears picked up voices from a couple asking for Peter. Using his eyes, Naruto searched where the voice came from. Wait here and don't move no matter what. You'll get swallowed up by that mob. Peter nodded to Naruto's instruction. Naruto let go of Peter and slowly approached the couple from behind and tapped their shoulder. Yes, can we help you? Ben Parker asked respectfully but clearly in a rush. You looking for a kid? Brown hair. Brown eyes. Wearing an Iron Man helmet. About yay high. Yes. 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 That's Peter. Have you seen him? May implored desperately. Well. Naruto pointed behind him. He's over there. Come on. The couple followed him without a second thought. They quickly cleared the crowd and when Peter saw his uncle and aunt, he ran at full tilt towards them. The family had an emotional meeting. Ah. Before you go full teary-eyed. Naruto reached inside his jacket and pulled two metal calling cards and gave it to Ben. Call the red and gold card if Peter is as smart as he looks like. Just say my name. Petey knows it. Call the orange card if he does anything weird. Anything at all. He explained. Either way. I'll know if you called. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May said while hugging Naruto. She eventually let go. Really? Thank you. Ben added. Didn't do it on the goodness of my heart. Believe me. Naruto took a step back. Just call the numbers when I told you to. Tony would love to corrupt more kids than his own. As long as they're not a couple of dumb dumb. Ben and Mary looked confused for a moment so they looked into the cards. The orange card only has a phone number engraved into it. The red and gold card though was something special. Both sides have engraved phone numbers. One side has the name Potts while the other has Stark. Stark. It's quickly apparent who owns those numbers. Oh my god. It's Tony Stark's number. You gave us Tony Stark's number. Just who are? You. May cut herself off when they saw Naruto suddenly missing. Where did he go? Chapter 92, New York Rumble Part 5. Stark Expo, New York. June 2, 2010, 2025 H Local. Hey man. I can see them coming now. Rody shouted through the comms before hearing Tony land beside him. Where have you been? Saving a kid. Tony replied while looking around, noticing the remains of hammer drones. Looks like you cleaned up here nicely. He then pointed towards the swarm. You have the big gun. Just make sure they drop away from the buildings. Oh yeah. My pleasure. You could hear his smile under his helm. Rody bent his knees a bit and aimed the machine railgun forward. The auto-aiming system went into overdrive and tagged each and every drone. The moment the drones passed the pavilions, he opened fire. 2,000 rounds per minute of grain of sand-sized projectiles traveling at Mach 10 speeds could do some serious damage. In a matter of seconds, Rody already crashed half of the drones, particularly the less armored ones. It left the Army and Navy drones, the more destructive variant. That answers that. I need to superheat the metal to retain its stopping power over a distance. Tony muttered to himself. Anyway. Let's get to it. He added before flying off. Tony. Tony used his air superiority to dodge and attack the hammer drones. Rody joined in and did the same thing, pelting the drones with the railgun. 
They were in the middle of utterly dominating the drones when something unexpected took care of all of it. The Hulk and the Abomination burst through one of the buildings and bulldozed the dozens of the remaining drones. They left as quickly as they came while punching and throwing stuff at one another. Huh. That was easier than I thought. Tony let out before seeing another pair running from where the giants came from and headed towards where they went. Oh. Uh. Who was that? They appear to be another pair that came one after the other that came shortly after Dr. Banner and Mr. Blonsky arrived. Jarvis interjected while pulling up camera feeds showing a woman in black chasing after Banner with a man following shortly after. Reports from the military say they have been instrumental in bringing down the possible casualties caused by Mr. Blonsky's initial rampage. They have been searching and evacuating civilians prioritizing people in the line of fire. Now, Tony had a few moments in his life where he went on to the deep end. Digging everything he can on a specific subject or doing research and engineering sprees were some of his favorite deep end activities. After his parents died, he went on to a deep end and researched everything he can on his parents. Including Howard Stark's Golden Boy, Steve Rogers, Captain America. So, it isn't much surprising when he recognized one of the people chasing the Goliaths. That's Steve Rogers. Tony let out. Who? Rhodey asked for clarification. You know Steve Rogers. Captain America. What? Rhodey exclaimed. Naruto really called in the big guns. I thought we were the big guns. We have the big guns. He is the big gun. Well, that, that doesn't hit me in my insecurities. You have an insecurity with Captain America? Eric interjected. I forgot you're still hooked in the line. Tony sighed. I am not insecure. How would I be insecure? I'm Tony Stark. It isn't like my father didn't give more attention to a not-so-dead guy than his son. Rhodey turned his head and stared at Tony before saying something. I thought you already worked over that problem? Eh. It comes on from time to time. Tony shrugged as he answered. Huh, what do you know? Tony Stark has daddy issues too. Eric commented causing Tony to cringe. No 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 no. First of all, don't ever use the term daddy issues. Secondly, don't ever use Tony Stark and daddy issues in the same sentence. Most importantly, I don't have daddy issues. Tony said one after another. As you can see. My best friend doesn't have daddy issues. Rhodey defended. Anymore. Ha, ha, ha. Tony let out in a patriotizing way. Tony was about to continue when something wrapped around him and pulled him up and away. Rhodey looked up and saw a large armor suit carrying Tony with an electrified whip, to which he quickly followed. Ho ho -ah. Holy shift. Tony's voice could be heard through the comms. I'm on your tail. Don't worry. Rhodey replied. Try bringing him to the left. I got no clear shot from my nest. Eric added. When he saw Tony leaning his weight to the left and opening his repulsors, he continued. Holy shift. Why can't you just say shit? Really? Right now. Tony asked incredulously. Right. Right. I'll come back to that later. Eric nonchalantly replied, before chambering a bullet in his sniper rifle. Are you ready? I got the fucker in my sights. Do it. Not long after Tony's signal, Eric took his shot, hitting Vanko straight to the head. The armor-piercing round didn't pierce the helmet, but it did its job well enough. Vanko was greatly stunned when the bullet hit, causing his head to be hit with a powerful ringing noise before crashing to the ground. Tony qui quickly untangled himself from the electrified whip and put some distance between himself and the deranged Russian. Rhodey landed behind him and aimed his heavy weaponry towards the copycat. You good? Rhodey asked in concern. Yeah. 
It's a good thing I got the power redirector and the capacitors working before going here. Tony checked on the systems to make sure they're still online and looked at the burns around his body. He also checked on his body before noticing pain in his left shoulder. It looks like I busted my left arm against though. We'll check on it later. Rody started before his body tensed. Cause this guy just is really set on a big fight. Vanko reeled in his whip while slowly standing up. He shook his head a bit and reoriented himself. Ha! Nothing like a conk in the head to wake somebody up. Eh, Tony Stark. Vanko's voice could be heard through the external speakers with his usual Russian drawl. Tony carefully observed the armor to take a general assessment of its characteristics. Vanko's armor was eerily similar to Stain's Iron Munger armor. Although it's clearly more focused on agility rather than defense. There are clear weak points in Vanko's armor, and these were the same as Stain's the exposed hydraulics. Multiple hydraulic pistons and actuators were prominent around the body, especially near the joints. There's also the enlarged gauntlets and cumbersome chamber for the whips. Everybody's a copycat these days and again not a great one at that. Tony taunted. I mean, you can't even double your rotations to up your output or efficiency. You have three reactors for God's sake. Why is that? One for the armor and one for each whip? He continued before pulling back a little bit. By the way, I can't say the word whip without thinking of something kinky. Ha ha ha. That's right. Laugh now Stark. You won't be able to when you're six feet feet underground. A whirring sound could be heard from Vanko's back as the whip slowly emerged from his gauntlets. Blue plasma and electricity forced their way through the hollow whip. Let's see if you can dance. Vanko jumped high in the air and did an acrobatic rotation, making both whips fly toward the iron duo. Tony and Rody separated to dodge the electrified strikes which were strong enough to deeply gouge the concrete. Rody kept on running around Vanko while continuously using the shoulder railgun. Tony, as a more experienced user of the armor, used the repulsors to propel him along the ground with an occasional repulsor blast. Between the two, it's quickly apparent that the Iron Man armor wasn't made for running. Vanko tried protecting his joints while using the whips to try and hit them, but the barrage of projectiles prevented him from aiming. The lack of traditional weaponry prevented him from doing anything. Enough. Vanko shouted before foregoing defense and overextending his whip, hitting Rody. Rody felt low voltage electricity pass through his body, unlike what happened to Tony. It was because Tony wasn't able to upgrade the capacitors, so there were still some of the runoffs that eventually makes their way to the user. Fuck. Rody cursed. That stings. Yeah, sorry about that. Forgot to upgrade the suit. Tony sheepishly said. No shit. Rody rolled on the ground to dodge the whips before using the repulsors to move him away. I'm using the anti-tank missile. A compartment opened up on the war machine's shoulder revealing four warheads, one of which was spinning and glowing red. He was about to fire the missile when Eric's voice blasted through the comms. Move. 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 Fueled by his training, Rody promptly cancelled the launch sequence before jumping and activating the thrusters. A second later, the Hulk and the Abomination landed where Rody was. Holy fucking shit. Rody breathed out in relief. Thanks, man. No problem. I'm getting paid other way so I'd rather you're not turned into paste. Eric replied which didn't reassure Rody one bit. The Hulk already had multiple punctures and lacerations. Green blood was slowly oozing out through his wounds. The abomination was in a similar state, with even a few spikes broken. They both promptly stopped when they saw where they landed this time. The Hulk however kept slapping himself while never taking his eyes off Blonsky. All you weaklings are still alive? The Abomination asked with a huge grin. 
I somehow forgot your pale crotchless ass under all this mess. Tony commented. There's just too many villains. It's a good thing there are a lot more heroes. A charismatic, authoritative voice can be heard from behind the Hulk. Two persons walked out from the Hulk's shadow effectively revealing themselves. They walked out confidently to the right of the Hulk. However, in a completely unexpected turn of events, both of them placed their hands on their knees and looked to be completely exhausted. I thought you guys never get exhausted? Tony asked incredulously. Sod off, you bloody toff. Peggy let out, still recovering her stamina. We were fighting the dodgy bugger before running all around and making sure these wankers didn't accidentally kill someone. So, give us a break, Stark. One of the consequences of Tony's insanely high IQ was the eidetic memory, and that voice certainly came from the geriatric and Peggy. The geriatric and supposedly dead and Peggy. He even visited her grave. Now, ever since his life started getting complicated, there's only one person he can reliably blame when something like this happens. Fucking Naruto. Tony cursed to the air. The people around him looked at him weirdly weirdly, but almost all of them knows whatever happened, his curse was totally justified. I'll take care of it. Don't worry. Another voice interrupted from behind Tony. When he turned around, he saw two masked women walking towards them. Natasha Lai. Emo girl. Tony greeted. Tony. Natasha moved her head a bit and stared at Vanko, who was using the downtime on readjusting his suit. I see you haven't finished him off yet. It's a lot harder bringing him down than I thought. Tony replied. Well. We have to deal with two of them now. Natasha answered before turning towards the Hulk. You're still ready to go? The Hulk just grunted again in affirmation. All right. Are we going to do this or not? Jessica inquired while cracking her fingers. Chapter 93, New York Rumble Part 6 Clint's Homestead, Missouri June 2, 2010, 1940 H. Local Clint has been enjoying his vacation time. The last mission in New Mexico got out of control extremely fast. Who knew Norse gods and nigh-indestructible murder bots could make everything more complicated? He wouldn't say it out loud, but he's kinda thankful that Naruto was there to take on the heavyweights. Clint has a tendency to renovate his homestead whenever he has extended vacation time. The recent target of his hobby, the front porch. Now, this should be like any other of his past projects, just a peaceful way to project his desire to rebuild what he destroys. However, there's something different this time. You really shouldn't do something like this at night. It's better to do this in the morning. Enjoy the time with your family. A female voice said behind, behind Clint causing him to release a breath. If somebody told me that fighting literal gods wouldn't be the craziest thing that would happen to me this week, I wouldn't believe them in a thousand years. Clint said with a glib tone. I mean seriously every one of you has nothing in common. The two-tailed, blue-flamed cat, Matatabi jumped down from the railing and ambled towards Clint. Were balls of almost infinite energy that acquired consciousness and physical form. Not much makes sense about us. Matatabi countered. Clint had to concede with that reasoning. Some things just don't make sense in this world. He stood up and went inside his house with the flaming cat following him. The interior can only be described as chaotic. Lila and Cooper were running around the living room chasing a small red fox and horse dolphin with a massive blue and green beetle flying over them. There's also a brown rat thing jeering from inside a pot. A red gorilla was hanging down the overhead lighting. Finally, a brown ox octopus thingy and a blue tortoise were sitting in a basin of water while chatting with Laura. When did this house a petting zoo? Clint asked to himself. When you said yes to Naruto. Matatabi replied. He said he needs some space for his pets. I thought he meant a horse or even a lion. 
that's what you get assuming things. Matatabi jumped to Clint's head and made herself comfortable. At that point, Clint's just too resigned to complain. And just to be clear, we already punished him for calling us pets. Ha! Huh. What did you guys do? Clint asked while navigating his way through the living room chaos towards his wife. We told on him to Natasha. Clint physically flinched hearing the cat's answer. Nat has earned her reputation to being a hard ass. God bless his soul. Clint approached Laura and gave her a peck on the cheek. What are we making? We're going to have Jayadin. Laura replied while chopping some onions and garlic. Giyuki's been teaching me how to cook some Japanese cuisine. What? What? Not seafood? Clint joked before releasing a chuckle. We had octopus takoyaki when you were gone. Laura deadpanned. Clint scrunched his forehead in confusion. He then slowly turned towards the basin and stared at the very prominent tentacles moving around. Oh my god. We bought some. You bought an octopus in the middle of nowhere Missouri? There's the one specialty food shop in the town. Just had to place an advance order. Is it good? Good enough. Could have been crispier. Yuki interjected. You ate some too. Isn't that weird? Not really. Had to taste if your wife made it right. Lila loved it. I'm thinking of making some more in the future. Laura excitedly replied. Clint was about to reply when somebody knocked on the door which caused both him and Laura to go into high alert. The homestead was the most secure safe house he have. His neighbors, if you could call them that is they're at least a mile away, know not to visit after hours as long as it wasn't an emergency. So, it's extremely peculiar that someone would come visiting at this time. Take the kids. I'll answer the door. Clint said in a low tone while working his towards his bow. Don't worry. It's just Naruto. Matatabi spoke up before releasing a humming sound. Well, maybe you should worry. Cause you know, he's Naruto. Clint released a full-blown groan hearing the name. Naruto could just somehow make everything, lively and lively was the last thing he wants at this time. He walked towards the door and opened it revealing a grinning Naruto with a cooler. Brought food. Naruto announced with a smile. Just wanted to see if you want to watch the news. The news? News? Clint whispered to himself. What did you do now? He asked while practically sprinting towards the TV. From behind him, he could hear Lila shouting Naruto's name in joy and the fox thing saying something about not being a stuffed toy and stuff but he's to focus on his current task to think about anything else. He turned the TV on and scanned the channels until eventually, he caught something from a local New York channel. Local police finally lifted the local air traffic restrictions above the Stark Expo. So, for the first time, we would be able to see what's happening in the Expo itself. A man reported while practically shouting into his mic. There. There. Point it there. The camera turned towards the fight. Two giants were fighting with some smaller men putting in some shots. A massive armor can also be seen fighting two Iron Man suits, and again, while somebody else was taking some pot shots here and there. Clint could clearly see that one of those fighters was Natasha. It's a fight of heroes versus villains. Tony Stark, along with Colonel Rhodes, a few other heroes, and the Hulk of Culver and Brazil, are fighting a monster and a robot or an armor just like the Iron Man suit. Clint had his eyes glued to the TV, watching the battle. So what's happening? Oh, and thank you for the food. Laura said while organizing and reheating the food from the cooler. She can't really hear the television from the kitchen. I mean, I never saw Clint so glued to the TV before. Well, except for sports. It's the Battle of Stark Expo. Don't know if that name would stick, but that's what I'm calling it. Can you pass me the Red Bull? Thanks. Naruto continued while transferring the food. 
In an absolutely shocking turn of events that wasn't manipulated whatsoever, two individuals with unique capabilities happened to wreak havoc in New York at the same time. Your particular hobby will bite you in the ass one day. Laura chided with a scold scolding tone. Eh. I'll just cross the bridge when the time comes. Naruto replied. By the way, how are the guys doing? They're great. Lila and Cooper really like being around them, and they're able to look after the kids too from time to time. Laura answered while placing the plates and utensils on the table. Some of them have worrying manners and vocabulary though, but I already taught them to behave in front of the kids. Wow. I'm impressed. I never managed to teach them to be polite. It's because you lack that particular virtue. Sticks and stones, Laura. Sticks and stones. Laura just shook her head in amusement at Naruto's answer. Stark Expo, New York. June 2, 2010, 2050 H Local. Jessica got thrown away when a particular ground attack by the abomination caused rocks to fly in all directions. Natasha managed to soften the impact by tackling Jess midair towards the bushes. Nat stood up slowly while checking for injuries before helping Jess up. You okay? Nat asked. Just peachy. Jessica straightened her back, causing a few pops. I'm all for a good smackdown, but this is just ridiculous. You're right. We're at a stalemate. We need something to break the balance. Nat replied. It's a bit hard to believe that a group with the Hulk, two super soldiers, two advanced exosuits, a super spy, an enhanced individual, and a former special operative as support couldn't put down Vanko and Blonsky. However, a few factors were working against the heroes. Tony and Rhodey's suits were low on ammo and energy. Steve and Peggy were running on fumes. While the Hulk's raw strength was a league of its own, Blanky's training proves to be effective in dealing damage. His hard bony under armor doesn't certainly help with both offense and defense. Vanko's smart fighting style plays off well in Blonsky as he aims to support his temporary ally. Nat stared at the fight. Stark and Rhodes focused on Vanko while Banner was on Blonsky. Rogers and Carter were bouncing of the two as needed. Stark. Natasha called out. A little busy. Stark replied. We'll hold Vanko. Everyone else focus on Blonsky. We're just exhausting ourselves like this. Stark he hesitated for a second before quickly changing target, to which Rhodes followed suit. Vanko was about to launch his whip, but Jessica grabbed hold of his arm. Round two, bitch. Clint's Homestead, Missouri. June 2, 2010, 1955 H Local. Ha! Finally. They're doing something different. Naruto shouted out of nowhere. No shouting on the table. Lila said with a sing-song voice causing Laura to snicker. Clint, on the other hand, still had his eyes glued on the television even while is eating. That thing right there. Naruto said while pointing to the TV. Would give Fury's Avengers initiative a bit more weight. That was able to take Clint's eyes away from the TV. Avengers initiative? I heard a bit but Fury wouldn't tell me much. Even Coulson's a bit dodgy. I wouldn't usually tolerate work talk on the table but I'm curious too. So spill. Laura joined in. Naruto took a sip of water before answering. It's Fury's brainchild. To bring a group of extraordinary people together to achieve something greater than themselves. Naruto started. But of course, it's Fury so it's a bit darker than that. It's his failsafe in case S.H.I.E.L.D. fails him, and with Hydra in the mix, it's an increasing threat. So, who's in that group? Laura asked. As of now? Stark, Banner, Rogers, Romanoff. Naruto stared at Clint dead in the eye. And Barton. Clint scoffed hearing the list. It's gonna fail. 
Everybody's too different in ideologies and way of thinking. Some are also incredibly volatile. Clint gave his honest assessment. Not to mention the more than likely clash between Stark and Rogers. All valid points. Naruto conceded. But with the threat level, the Avengers initiative is supposed to deal with. You guys can't afford to fail. That sent shivers down Clint and Laura's spine. Disregarding Naruto's implied threat level, there's one thing they can't get out of their minds. What the hell was a guy with a bow and arrow supposed to do at that level? Oh. It looks like they're just about done. Stark Expo, New York. June 2nd, 2010, 2100 H Local. You lose, Stark. Vanko said with a grin before laughing hysterically. His arc reactors started beeping. Almost everyone immediately connected the dots. Tony grabbed hold of Nat and Jess's clothes before flying away. Rhodey did the same with Steve and Peggy. They were in mid-flight when all the hammer drones in Vanko's suit blew up, devastating everything around them. The group landed on the rooftop where Eric was nestled. Sheesh. The insurance company would go broke. Tony let out, trying to inject some humor in the situation. Everyone except for Tony, Rhodey and Eric, which already walked out of his hole, was already slumped on the ground, exhausted from the battle. Steve was about to remove his mask when Nat spoke up. Better keep that on, Cap. There's still some media helicopter flying around. You don't want that much attention now. The name partially startled Steve as he put in the effort to hide his identity. Don't be surprised, Cap. You're as famous as they come. It'll be hard not to recognize you. As Nat was done speaking, something large dropped somewhere at the backside of the building. They turned around and saw the Hulk. The Hulk intensely stared at them for a moment before he slowly shrunk. The sequence of events was a weird yet fascinating thing to watch. In the end, all that's left was an average-looking guy with only ripped, stretched-out pants covering his lower half. So. I'm. I'm Bruce Banner. Bruce introduced himself. Talk about a crazy day, huh? That's it for this reading. Hit like and subscribe for a free ticket pass going to the different worlds of anime fanfictions. Looking forward to having you on board again.